well-regulated militia be necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I am so glad you have uh, joined us on the program today. Uh, now, at BearingArms.com, we are keeping our eyes on what's going on uh, in the House of Representatives, where Democrats expected to uh, bring a couple of gun control bills to the uh, floor for debate today. Could see a vote today. Could see a vote uh, as early uh, as this afternoon. Uh, likely going to be tomorrow, according to uh, what Congressman uh, Lamborn told us on uh, yesterday's program. Uh, as I uh, sit down to uh, record this, uh, the House has not yet taken up debate on these uh, two gun control measures. But uh, we've got full coverage for you at BarronArms.com. I would encourage you to uh, visit the website and uh, check out some of the uh, commentary and analysis of these uh, gun control proposals, including H.R. 8, the Universal Background Check Bill, H.R. 1446, uh, which again would expand the uh, length of time that the FBI can uh, conduct a background check from the current three days to basically an indefinite period of time. Uh, problematic, I think, for uh, the rights of Americans who would like to uh, lawfully purchase a firearm. Uh, but, you know, gun control advocates, they're not going to stop there. Uh, and in fact, gun control advocates are not necessarily just waiting for uh, a Congress uh, to try to enact Joe Biden's uh, anti-gun agenda. They are trying to do this at the local level as well in states across the country. You've got uh, Washington State considering the uh, ban on open carrying at the Capitol, uh, as well as uh, at or near permitted political gatherings. Uh, and in Philadelphia, you know, you've got uh, Mayor Jim Kenney, District Attorney Larry Krasner, uh, Police Commissioner Daniel Outlaw. They have all called on uh, state lawmakers in Harrisburg to pass a number of gun control bills. They are getting support, you will not be shocked to learn, by uh, Ceasefire Pennsylvania, which is probably the state's uh, largest gun control organization at the state level. Uh, Josh Flightman with Ceasefire PA has a piece of the Pittsburgh Tribune review. We must vaccinate against the gun violence epidemic, too. Right. Uh, and how do we do that? Well, I've actually got a story at Bearing Arms this afternoon talking about a way to vaccinate against uh, violent crime that does not involve new gun control laws that's actually being put in place in Philadelphia. Josh Fleitman doesn't like that. Josh Fleitman wants more gun control laws on the books. That's how he believes we vaccinate and inoculate ourselves against violent crime. He says the vaccine for this entirely preventable yet worsening epidemic is within reach. Common sense policies that have proven effective at saving lives while respecting responsible gun ownership. We simply need to muster the political will and marshal the sense of urgency that this crisis demands. So he's calling for, he says, three policies that could be enacted today in Harrisburg and immediately make our community safer. What they call the common agenda to end gun violence. So let's take a look at these proposals, because I don't really think that they're common sense. I don't think that they adequately address violent criminals, and they are, in fact, all targeted at legal gun owners and restricting the rights of legal gun owners who aren't the ones driving violent crime in Pennsylvania or any other state of the union. So here's Josh's first idea. Yep, universal background checks. Current state law, he says, already requires background checks for most gun sales with one glaring loophole. The private sale of long guns, such as shotguns and military-style semi-automatic assault rifles which are most commonly used in mass shootings and attacks on police officers. This type of policy says to prevent guns from getting in the wrong hands is supported by 88% of Pennsylvania voters. Perhaps this could have prevented an infant's tragic death in Spring Hill. Perhaps, he says. Probably not, because criminals don't obey these laws. Look, Josh just admitted that Pennsylvania requires background checks to be performed on every private transfer of a handgun, which are the guns that are used most often in crime. Are criminals paying attention to that law? Not in Philadelphia, where there were 499 homicides last year. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, not a single concealed carry holder or, or even legal gun owner arrested for any one of those homicides. So what on earth does Josh think is common sense about requiring background checks on these sales or transfers, including private transfers, of all firearms when the laws that are already on the books in Pennsylvania aren't reducing violent crime in Pittsburgh 
or in Philadelphia. Again, background checks are already required on all private transfers of handguns in the state of Pennsylvania. Josh Flightman acknowledges this. These are the guns that are most often used in crime. Flightman does acknowledge that. And by the way, his uh, statement about, uh, uh, quote, military-style semi-automatic assault rifles, which are most commonly used in mass shootings and attacks on police officers. No, actually, they're most commonly used by legal law-abiding citizens for recreational shooting, for competition, for self-defense. They are rarely used in any crime. In fact, according to the FBI crime statistics, more people in an average year killed by fists or feet than by a rifle of any kind. So Josh might be right that the public, the polling on this issue, says, yeah, people should have a But, you know, you get into the details, and I really don't think that there is broad support for putting people in prison if they were to loan a firearm to their neighbor so she could protect herself against her abusive ex, which is, by the way, what Josh's proposal would do. Now, what about his second big idea? Red flag laws. Extreme risk protection orders, he says. And ERPO empowers family members and law enforcement officers to go through a civil court proceeding with full due process protections <laughs> to temporarily restrict a person's access to firearms when they're an imminent risk to themselves or others. States that have passed such laws have seen declines in suicides and mass shootings. One wonders if the murder-suicide in Upper St. Clair, Pennsylvania, could have been avoided had this option been available. Again, talk about some disingenu uh, disingenuous arguments here. So, first of all, the studies don't show that red flag laws are particularly effective at reducing suicides, mass shootings, or any other type of violent crime. The uh, states that have had these laws on the books for the longest period of time, Indiana and Connecticut, and in both of those states, while gun-related suicides declined after the passage of red flag laws, the overall suicide rate in both states increased. Now, to my mind, the goal of a, uh, an ERPO or an extreme risk protection order shouldn't be to uh, uh, tell somebody, well, if you're going to off yourself, do it in a fashion that doesn't involve a gun. The goal should actually be to reach that person who's in crisis, get them the help that they need. Red flag laws don't do that. Red flag laws are gun control bills masquerading as mental health proposals. They offer the promise of safety. Instead, what they really do is, again, take people's guns away without due process because the guns are seized first and then a couple of weeks later you get to go to court where you have to prove that you're not a danger to yourself or to anybody else, rather than prosecutors proving that you are. Again, you can have your firearms taken from you without being accused of a crime, without being arrested, certainly without any conviction, because these are not actually criminal proceedings, which, by the way, also means that you're not entitled to a public defender. If you can't afford an attorney who can fight for your rights, you got to go it alone. Going up against prosecutors, who, by the way, have a lower burden of proof than they would in a criminal case, to convince a judge that, yeah, you know, we think he might be a danger to himself or others. And if a judge goes along, again, what happens? Well, your guns are seized. You're left alone with your knives and your gasoline and your matches, and your belt and your rope and your pills and anything else that you might use to harm yourself or others. You're not going to get mental health treatment. You're going to be left alone. And you will still be a danger to yourself or others because it's ultimately you, the individual. I'm sorry, not you. Not you specifically. But it's ultimately, again, the individual that the court says is a danger to themselves or others. And then what do they do with that individual? Nothing. They take their legally owned guns away and then think that the problem is solved. Well, the problem isn't solved because it's not a gun issue. It's a mental health issue. And red flag laws don't address mental health. At all. Josh's uh, third and final big idea for his uh, Comet agenda in Pennsylvania, requiring the reporting of lost and stolen firearms. Yep. He says uh, an estimated 43,768 firearms were stolen in Pennsylvania between 2012 and 2017, yet state law doesn't require that these guns be reported to police. How does, how does Josh know that these 43,000? Actually, better question. Let's say, let's say 43,768 firearms that had been stolen were recovered by police. How many of them actually had been reported stolen? Because I'm guessing that the vast majority of gun owners, if a theft is discovered, will tell the police, right? 
The problem with this is that Josh and other gun control advocates want to criminalize crime victims if they fail to provide a full and complete accounting to police of whatever guns might have gone missing within 24, 48, or 72 hours of that theft taking place. That's a problem. Now, Josh says that, uh, well, if we had this law in place, uh, we could reduce crime. He said lost and stolen guns appeal to those who cannot pass a background check and are the weapon of choice for criminals due to their difficulty to track. Rep- well, a- a- again, reporting these guns stolen, which I believe happens most of the time anyway, but but even once a gun's been reported stolen, you can't track it. Even if you had a lost or stolen gun on the books, you, you, you can't track a gun that's been stolen. I'm, I'm, I'm really confused here by Josh's argument. Uh, he says that reporting these missing weapons would help police get illegal guns off the streets and interrupt straw purchasing schemes. Maybe this, he says, could have prevented the shooters from obtaining the weapons that killed the teen in Penn Hills and a teacher in Westmoreland County. Do we know that those guns weren't reported stolen? I mean, I, Josh said maybe if this was in place, then maybe those crimes could have been committed. Do we know that those guns were not reported stolen to police? And as a, a tool to fight straw purchasing, a lost or stolen bill actually does the opposite. Because right now, as it stands, under Pennsylvania law, uh, well, let, 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 let me back up. Under the proposal that Josh lays out, if you did engage in a straw purchase, let's say you bought a gun for somebody you know is not eligible to own one, you give them that gun. What's your next step if there's a lost or stolen law on the books? You call the police and you report that gun stolen. That's what you do. As soon as that illegal transfer has been made, you call the police and you indemnify yourself. Hey, yeah, I just want to let you know, man, I bought a gun a couple weeks ago and uh, I, I came home and it's gone missing. I don't know, man. I, I, I don't know who took it. Maybe one of my friends or family. I don't know, but it's gone now. Police don't have the resources or the manpower to go out and launch full-scale investigations every time a gun gets stolen. In fact, a lot of police departments won't even come out and and check on a burglary report. You're expected to file a report, and that's about the end of the story. So this actually makes things worse from a law enforcement perspective because it provides an easy out for criminals engaging in straw purchases. You want to cut down on straw purchases? Here's an idea. Increase the penalty for taking part of a uh, for taking part in a straw purchase. I have more prison time. Don't allow for plea bargains. Uh, don't allow for time served and slaps on the wrist. Actually, get serious about this. Lost or stolen legislation doesn't. Again, this is aimed at legal gun owners. So I got to tell you, for something that was billed as common sense, these are nonsensical ideas that would do absolutely nothing to stop violent crime in Pennsylvania or any other place in the country because they're aimed at people who aren't breaking the law and people who aren't committing violent crimes, the tens of millions of legal gun owners in the United States. And ultimately, I think that's what Josh's real goal is. He can say it's about public safety. He can say we've got to inoculate ourselves against gun violence. What he really wants to do is to try to ban gun ownership, at least inoculate ourselves against the Second Amendment rights of American citizens to keep and bear arms. You do that. You don't end up with a gun-free country. You do that, you end up with Washington, D.C. before the Heller decision. You end up with Chicago before the McDonald decision. You end up with places where legal, law-abiding Americans cannot exercise their Second Amendment rights and criminals don't care that they're not allowed to possess a firearm. They go ahead and do it anyway because they're still violating the laws against murder and rape and robbery, and carjackings, and kidnappings. That's what criminals do. And this is what gun control advocates do. They aim their fire at legal gun owners in the name of fighting for public safety. All right, let's turn our attention now to today's armed citizen story. Speaking of uh, defensive gun uses, uh, our uh, recidivist report and our good deed of the day. We're going to start with our recidivist report. Case out of Texas. Boy, this one, I got to tell you. This is uh, infuriating. Harris County, Texas, KTRK. A hearing on Monday with a a juvenile judge in Harris County 
ended up with an 18-year-old who was convicted in the murder of a good Samaritan being released from detention. Yeah, the victim in this case, uh, Moises Aragin, was shot and killed in July of 2018, just steps from his front door. He had heard sounds outside of his home, and he looked out the window and saw that there was a teenager who was being robbed by a group of uh, individuals. So he grabbed a baseball bat and he ran outside, and he was shot and killed by those who were attacking the teenager. There were three suspects arrested. Two of them were juveniles at the time. 19-year-old Gilbert Gomez confessed. He pleaded guilty in the adult system. He got a 25-year prison sentence. A 15- and 16-year-old both sentenced under the juvenile justice system. And KTRK reports on Monday the teen who was 16 years old at the time was sentenced to 10 years behind bars. Now, less than three years later, he goes before a judge asking, do I really have to serve the rest of my sentence or can I just get out? And the judge in this case, uh, Natalia Oaks, said, yeah. Yeah, you shouldn't spend any more time behind bars. Go on, get out of here. Oh, by the way, uh, you're on probation for the next seven years and you have to wear an ankle monitor. But other than that, you're free to go. Aragine's sister, Brenda Reyes, says it was painful to know that the judge thinks that someone who commits such a horrible crime can actually become a better person. Even the suspect who was released said he knows that they're not getting enough time for what they did. I mean, that's amazing. Uh, Aragine's brother, Roberto Negretti, said um, the judge was very sympathetic for, towards the, uh, uh, the suspect uh, for some reason. He said, I guess she doesn't know that he murdered my brother. Uh, former former uh, juvenile prosecutor Stephen Aslett telling uh, KTRK that uh, based on the fact that juveniles were given specific sentence lengths, uh, it indicates that this was a, quote, determinate sentence case. He said that normally the juvenile justice system has to let you out at age 19, but with a determinate sentence, you can be transferred to an adult court uh, and be monitored in the adult court system until your sentence is up or you're eligible for parole. Well, again, whatever the uh, legal justification, a man... A uh, young man at the time, 16, going to uh, get out of prison after serving less than three years in the death of a good Samaritan there in Harris County. Yeah. Tell me again why we need another gun control law instead of enforcing the laws that are currently on the books. Better enforcing the laws that are currently on the books. Today's armed citizen story from Atlanta, Georgia, where an armed citizen stopped a robbery suspect at a Midtown Chick-fil-A. WSB reporting they got the call about uh, 3 p.m. on Tuesday about a man who had entered the restaurant inside Colony Square with a gun. He had demanded cash. Uh, according to eyewitnesses, uh, there were three shots fired inside the restaurant, those uh, coming from an armed citizen who tried to stop the robbery. Uh, as the man then ran from the restaurant, several other people nearby saw what was going on and attempted to stop him. One of them fired two shots and held the robbery suspect at gunpoint until officers arrived. So ultimately, it sounds like you may have had two armed citizens uh, who were actually engaged in stopping that robbery and then uh, detaining the robber uh, until police arrived. The uh, suspect identified as 23-year-old Willie Gloston IV, now charged with armed robbery, aggravated assault, and possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony at the last report, he is in the Fulton County Jail, but given the state of our criminal justice system, I imagine he will soon be released. And uh, finally today, our good deed of the day. And this one, I got to tell you, this one is, a, uh, this is a, a painful good deed. Officer Jesse Madsen, a uh, police officer in Tampa, Florida, a father of three, lost his life uh, early Tuesday morning when he uh, veered into a car that was traveling the uh, wrong way down an interstate uh, in order to save other motorists. According to uh, Brian Dugan, the uh, chief of police in Tampa, uh, 25-year-old Daniel Montague of Golden, Colorado, was traveling the wrong way in the interstate when he hit Madsen's patrol vehicle. Both Madsen and Montague died. Chief Dugan says, We have reason to believe that Madsen veered into this oncoming car to protect others. That's what we have gathered through some of our witnesses from our investigation. The 45-year-old Madsen, a uh, Marine veteran who had worked for the Tampa Police Department for 16 years. In the course of that time, he obtained seven life-saving awards. 
Chief Dugan says, when you look at somebody who has earned seven life-saving awards, there is no surprise that he would take such swift action and do this. Madsen leaves behind two sons, 16 and 12, 10-year-old daughter, and a uh, community of family and friends and colleagues who I know are mourning his loss today, but in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing at the expense of his own life. We salute Officer Jesse Dugan for his life-saving good deed. And that is all the time we've got for you on this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. We will be back tomorrow with more of the latest Second Amendment news and information from all across the nation, including the latest on Capitol Hill, where the uh, debate is expected to begin again today, and the uh, vote could come uh, tomorrow morning, maybe, on these uh, two gun control bills. We'll have the latest on that for you, as well as uh, other Second Amendment news and information. So make sure you tune in. Don't forget, you can subscribe to Town Hall Media at YouTube. That way you'll never miss a program. Or if you like the rumble.com, uh, you can uh, subscribe to Bearing Arms Cam and Company, uh, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, the townhall.com podcast page as well. Plenty of ways for you to catch up with the latest Second Amendment news and information. Until we talk again, be well, be safe, and be free. <laughs>